So this is a poem about change, and nothing really changes faster than watching children grow up. They drive through childhood in their little cars. <laughs> Loving them, we love nothing, no one, if not change. As they drive through childhood in their little cars, steering so seriously into the future, while we follow a few steps behind, tripping through days and weeks and years, watching as they suddenly speed up without a glance backward, without waving goodbye. Not to grow older, not to grow up. Once safe in my kingdom of Coco, I wished for that, but years pushed me roughly out the door. I drove away in my little silver car, gripping the wheel too tightly, steering so seriously into the future, without a glance backward, without saying goodbye. Older now, we know, if we know nothing else, that we love them as they were and are, though what they are keeps changing. We can't keep up. How seriously they pedal their little cars into a future we won't be part of. In a moment, a turn ahead will take them out of sight as we follow, follow for dear life, practicing our goodbyes. So this is a poem that has to do with loss of memory, somebody gradually losing memory. <clears throat> A memory of the future. I will say tree, not pine tree. I will say flower, not forsythia. I will see birds, many birds, flying in four directions. Then rock and cloud will be lost. Spring will be lost, and most terribly, your name will be lost. I will revel in a world no longer particular, a world made vague as if by fog, but not fog. Vaguely aware, I will wander at will, I will wade deeper into wide water. You'll see me there, out by the horizon, an old gray thing who finally knows gray is the most beautiful color. Bishop, my first thought when I saw you enter the funeral home chapel for my father's rosary was that you peroxide your hair. <laughs> And then as you came nearer, how little changed by time your face seemed, except for a single bangle of a double chin, but no age lines, no grotesque enlargement of ears and nose, just a smooth, worryless, mild, unreadable Irish countenance, and that gingery hair, incongruous in a man so plain. A fondness for you stirred in me, not as a kind of pity, for what you'd become, but for what I realize you've always been, a short, insecure man with a compassionate heart, proficient at following directions but lacking the common touch, and whose timidity was now a form of cowardice. Fondness aside, when you showed up at the funeral home, I realized how much I disliked you which surprised me. And not even the grief I felt for my father could forgive it. I thought to myself, why do you think you can just show up here? Who do you think you are? In my version of the story, four years pass, and my bishop shows up at my mother's funeral. He's pushing a walker with squeaky plastic wheels and fluorescent tennis balls fixed to the back legs. His face is slack. A white pharmaceutical rhyme crusts the corners of his mouth. 
his gingery hair is gray. I follow his slow effort to reach the altar where he presumes he's wanted as concelebrant, but no one has invited him. At first, he won't look at me directly, but our eyes meet. He administers a fierce, unforgiving stare. He sees I'll never be ready for confession. I pity him. It's what we do. I pity, dislike, I'm fond of him. The truth of this is almost as bearable as the lie. Later, when I approach the sanctuary to deliver my mother's eulogy, I give him a quick involuntary wave, like a signal of surrender, or a sign that recognizes who we were more than 40 years ago, frightened boy and less frightened young priest. From the lectern, before I begin, I thank him publicly for his friendship. Thank you.